Hi, Misha here, and this is uh, another Patreon requested video. We have a tier system, and five dollars and up, you can request us to make a video. And I've been holding off doing this one, as I was hoping to get to the range and give uh, the person who ordered this video some range footage, at least. But with the whole COVID thing, and it just kept getting put in, put off and put off, and I thought, hell, let's just you know, do what we can do, and if we get time to go to the range with it later, great. If you can't tell by the gun on the table, this is going to be about the Valmet M62, or really any of the Valmet rifle series, the RK62 in military service, and uh, Clark Lowe, basically it says he he picked up a M76 side folder and 762-39 and is pretty happy with it and has checked out a lot of our older videos on Valmets and asks if we have information on import numbers and things like that. Going to disappoint? Not really. Um, I hate that, but there's not much new cooking as... Uh, Clark himself pointed out a lot of the information is to dead links. There's not a lot going on with the Valmet community. And therefore, not really any new information has come to light. And uh, in, import numbers in general are often hard to get. And even when you think you know one, sometimes you have to kind of look and go, where did this number come from? There's a lot of commonly accepted numbers and facts that aren't untrue, at least provably so, but also you kind of go, well, where did this get started? For example, it's commonly been stated that 150 762 39 M76s came in, but where did this number come from? I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's just kind of been a number that's been floating around. Likewise, there are some numbers very low even as low as some people claim only 10 of the side folding M76-762-39 came in. But I almost think that can't be true because I've seen more than that, it feels like, myself over the years. But uh, Clark also asked about bayonets, accessories, and specifically about the mags. So we can talk a bit more. And we haven't talked about the Vimat in a while, so this might just be a recap. First off, though, he does say at the end of his request that if we feel Vimats are played out, what about doing an FN, FNC video? He says he hadn't seen one of those. Actually, uh, we, we have done a couple of pretty extensive FNC videos, so I'll make sure to put the link to at least one of those in the description. Check it out. And actually, the one that Chris Bartacci did a couple of years ago, that, that rifle was a loner from us. Well, the Valmet. Not to really go on about the history too much, but this started off in the 1950s. Finland has always kind of had a frenemy relationship with Russia. It was once a Russian vassal state. It became independent in 1917. And it used Mosin-Nagants and later its own variants of Mosin-Nagants throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. But by that time, they, they needed a new rifle. They looked at several, and uh, several companies made offers to them. They, they, they pretty quickly decided they wanted to go with 7.6239 because that's what Russia was using, and it just makes sense for them to use the Russian round. And they, they looked at some, some guns in that chambering. For example, Switzerland did a STGW57 in the SG. 510 series in X39. It's even said HK made a roller delayed version for the finished trials, but in the end, they had received some Kalashnikovs made in Russia and they designated them for testing as the RK54. And then it said later that they received some made in Poland. However, the timeline doesn't quite line up. At the time, they were supposedly receiving these from Poland, 57, 58. 
Poland themselves are just starting up milled AK Type 3 production. It's possible Vinland acquired some of the earliest Radom produced guns, but it's more likely these were actually Russian guns, or at least built from Russian parts in Poland, and Poland was kind of used as a third party for political and industrial reasons. Either way, Finland got their hands on some AKs, and essentially the government ordered Valmet and Seiko, Valmet being a government institution and Seiko being nominally private, to develop something based around the AK platform. They held trials, and the initial Valmet version known as the M60, sometimes referred to as the RK60, was provisionally adopted, and some pre-production models were tested. They made some refinements, and it went into full adoption as the RK62, with full production commencing in 1965. Now, Valmet designed the RK62, but Seiko would actually produce them for the military, and Valmet would produce them for the consumer market and semi-auto, as well as try to export them, although they found very limited success. It had a 16-inch cold hammer forged barrel. Interestingly, it was not chrome-lined. had an interesting pinned-on three-prong flash hider with the bayonet lug here. And since Clark asked, here's the bayonet. There were two major makers. It is patterned after the Finnish puka. I know I didn't say that right. Don't at me. It's basically a combat knife, a sharp little knife, and these are, as far as military bandits go, among the sharpest you'll find. And it just simply locks on under the lug. If this looks similar to the VC-58's bayonet, there's a very good reason for that. And the uh, scabbard here is made out of reindeer hide, leather. Again, it doesn't really have a retention strap, it just has a loop. And there you go. The sling, too, was made of the same type of leather. has a metal hook on the front. There's a few different styles early on. You had, and then they would go to a single ridge type, and then late they would actually go to a two-piece stamps type. And while this other end wasn't designed to have a hook on it, a lot of Finnish soldiers would get a second hook, and that way they could have a kind of a early QD sling because this is a clip. So pretty neat. This is on a machined receiver. Loosely based on the AK Type 3, but with more and kind of fancy lightning cuts. The big difference are with the sights. Obviously, we have kind of the Galil style here with the hooded front post over your gas block. It is not elevation adjustable. There's no hole in the top. It's just windage adjustable. We have an exposed gas tube that dovetails into the front of the receiver. Very easy to take that off for cleaning. Early original handguards are these so-called cheese grater style. Metal and plastic, kind of a Bakelite material mix. Likewise, the pistol grip. It's kind of this rubbery plastic with the metal cylinder under it. We have a tubular buttstock. This is fixed. It has that same kind of rubbery plastic cheek rest has a storage compartment in the rear here that's for <clears throat> this cleaning kit and this little drawstring bag essentially there is a cleaning rod in here uh, brushes and a sight tool and then we have a rear sight mounted on the dust cover this was an innovation that Baumet had it's said to double the sight radius from an AK. The sight is adjustable. Originally they had these small ears that basically run flush with the top. 
It could also be flipped over. Because one early thing that was added in the 60s were night sights. So when you flip it over, you have a basic battle sight, notch style as opposed to aperture, and you also have a night sight. And the front night sight is here. You know, when your own's a Galil, it's that same, you know, flip up style. And Clark also asked about the mags. This is the original style. It's basically just your usual European, said to be copied from the Polish, which was copied from the Russian, 30 round steel. But it does have a layered loop, spot welded on the bottom. So if you drop it in the snow, you can easily fish it back out. And it has a mag catch, very Galil style. No uh, left side selector, and it has a pretty straight trigger, honestly. So this would, in short order, become the standard issue in the FDF, the Finnish Defense Forces, and is uh, actually still their standard gun today. There was talk about replacing it a few years ago, but they decided instead of replacing it, since they still had over 300,000 in inventory, just to um, modernize it. And that's known as the RK-62M. And that's essentially new modern handguards. They also added attachments for light laser on the barrel. They modified them to take scopes and they've gone away from the fixed tubular stock to an M4 type adjustable. And they've gotten away from the classy leather sling and gone to a modern tactical boring sling. <laughs> In the USA the Valmet is quite notable because this was the first semi-automatic AK to come into the country. And these first came in right around the 68 Gun Control Act. There are some available that are not import marked, which was not required. Well, the act was passed in 68, import marks became a thing in 69. Also, they don't always have as many semi-auto modifications like later imports, for example, having the, the tail, the trip machined off the bolt carrier. Originally, we had just this M62S, as it was known, only in 76239. The first, and again, the number that is commonly touted, 200, were this style with the military pistol grip and buttstock and cheese gritter handguards. But these did not sell well. Now, part of it was the caliber. 76239 was very unknown in America in the late 60s, early 70s. Part of it was felt was the very military look. The Vietnam War was going on, military stuff wasn't all that popular, so Valmet put a wood stock on it, probably inspired by the original M60, and a wood pistol grip. And it said they imported 800 to 1,000 of those. Still M62, still in 76239. Now, there, in Finland was a folding stock version known as the RK-62TP. There are rumors of a side folder M62S, but I wonder if these aren't mistaking a gun like Clark purchased, an M76F folder. I'll get to that in just a minute. Next to come in, the next major model, was the M71S. This was a very different gun. It was much more AK. And the ones we got over here were in 223, the new hotness in the early 70s. Now, Valmet did not make the N71 specifically for the American market. They did make a version in 76239 over in Finland, trying to get the FDF to purchase it. It had a stamped receiver, a la AKM, 
but the FDF, though they purchased a few samples, did not bite. Now there was also a folding stock, kind of an underfolding, a KMS style, that Valmet made. But again, I don't believe any that came into the U.S. The ones that seem to be here are either polymer or wood stocks. And these have an interesting thing that we'll see repeated. For some reason, the butt plates on the polymer or the wood stocks will crack. You can find one brand new in the box and just whatever plastic they made them out of or Bakelite, whatever, over time just seems to have cracked. One way or the other, the M71 was not successful in either Finland or in the USA. So its production run was relatively short with just a few thousand total, either select fire or semi-auto. But it was showing Valmet branching out and trying for uh, for new markets. But it was really just uh, just the beginning. With the M76 series, Valmet would strike gold and really hit their stride. They would be successful with the Finnish military and in America. Now the M76 was them basically going back to the M62 but replacing the machined, the milled receiver, with a reinforced, heavier, dutier, extra rivets, extra welding, extra thickness, stamped receiver. And the FDF liked this. They purchased it as the RK62-76. Now, if you've seen Finnish troops, and you wonder, well, why don't I see any of these stamped guns in service? Why is it always the milled? Simple. Even though the FDF bought them, most all were just stuck into long-term storage in case of war with, uh, well, with Russia. So they were still feeling that the machined gun, machined receiver gun, was uh, more durable, especially in the hands of a conscript army. But they had the 6276 in reserve. And that little nugget of info actually years ago took me quite a while to find. I actually had to, to get a Finnish government document to verify that yes the RK 6276 exists and of course for, for Finland that was in 76339 uh, Clark asked about accessories too so here are some two cell mag pouches these uh, pouches came from Numeric and they said that they're uh, finished so they're definitely a different pattern, but they're you can tell they're inspired by the Polish style. And here is a typical little plastic clear oil and solvent bottle. Usually they would issue two of these with the uh, with the RKs. I've seen some people squeeze them into the buttstock, but I always put mine in the little compartment here. Just it's a very tight fit in the stock with all the other gear. These hold, uh, again, like I said, three three mags each. Pretty typical pouch. So, the M76 and Marika. They would do the M76 and 76239. But with relatively poor sales of the original M62 and with decent sales, if not spectacular, of the M71, they would not stick with this. They would very soon introduce the 223, that's how it's marked, but even though it is a 556 NATO chamber, and 308, again how it's marked, even though it is 762 NATO variants. And these would do very well here, at least comparatively to earlier. And they would increase their furniture options. They would go away with on most models with the fixed tube stock, although there would be some, especially in the X-39. They would all be with the newer style of plastic pistol grip or a wood grip, but usually the new style plastic grip, more squared off. And they would go with the new polymer handguard that encompassed the barrel. They would do a side folding version, 
as well. Now, the M76 is interesting. It started off as a stamped receiver gun, but later there would be milled receiver M76s. If you're talking about the stamped receiver guns and it was done as a side folder, it would fold to the left and had a certain mechanism. And if you had a milled receiver in 76, it would fold to the right, kind of Galil style. And this was a prototype mechanism that would eventually be translated into the RK95 TP. There are a lot of cool variations in the N76 lineup. And one thing I don't see mentioned a lot, where the 223 and 762 guns have a 16 inch barrel, the 308 guns actually have an 18 inch barrel, so slightly longer. Makes sense because of the cartridge. 308 does very well out of an 18 inch barrel. The only downside then, and especially today, where the X39 versions feed from standard AK mags that have only become more ubiquitous over the years along with the ammo, the 223 used its own mag. Yes, Galil mags will lock in, however Many people warn against using Galil mags. If you want to try it, that's your that's your thing. But there are some pretty stern warnings about feeding and all that with Galil mags because of bullet setback concerns. You can read up about that. Uh, I'm not going to get into it here, but it's a thing. As far as 308, you're kind of even more out of luck. Not only did it use its own proprietary 20 round mags. There's actually two different styles, depending on if you're <laughs> which kind of receiver you have. There's two different patterns of 308 Valmet mag. But this is because these guns were made for commercial use. Although Qatar did purchase some 5.56 NATO Valmet rifles for their military in limited numbers. Now, as I said earlier, I have my doubts if an M. 62 folder actually came in because M76 folders like Clark's aren't necessarily marked M76. They're marked Valmet, of course, but I just have to wonder if people are mixing up the later 762-39 M76 folder with an earlier M62. Just a speculation. As to how many M60, excuse me, M76s came in, I really don't know. I've seen random numbers thrown out there, but it was definitely the, the largest single number if you count it all as one group. If you want to break it down by caliber, easy. 223 is the most common, especially the Woodstock 223, followed by 308. Again, the fixed stock, much more common than the 308 folder. And then finally, 76239 is the least common. Only, you know, 150, 200 fixed stocks are said to be here. And 10 to 60 folders, depending on who you, who you go with. But they're rare because they weren't selling. And they just brought a few of them over just to kind of have them. To go along with the M76 rifle, there was also the M78 which was a semi-automatic version based on a light machine gun, analogous to an RPK. It um, had some elements from the M71, including how the sights were set up, and it had the longer, heavier barrel with a unique bipod and handguard from the, uh, from the RPK kind of inspired thing. And the M78, in, with a stamped receiver, was 223 and 7.62.39 and for milled I've mostly seen them in 308 7.62 NATO but again they had milled and stamped in the M78 it was eventually evolved into the M78.83 which is meant to be more of a DMR gun and it had a thumbhole stock and a scope mount usually with the scope One of the last kind of military versions was the M82 Bullpup, <clears throat> which was about as successful as other AK style Bullpups. It was only brought over in 223. The uh, Finnish military, it's often said the paratroopers, did try it out and promptly rejected it for 
several reasons, including broken teeth. Finally, there was the Valmet Hunter, or Valmet M88, that was a much more sporterized version, including having a cross bolt safety instead of an AK style. As on this and other ones. Kind of think of like a, a Vepper Hunter with its safety. I like that. And that was really the last major version to come in. Because in 1986, Valmet ended the production line. And in 1987-88, Valmet as a company began divesting itself of its firearms division. And it said most of what was left was transferred over to Seiko. And Valmet's still around today as a company, they just don't do firearms. This means when the Finnish military wanted something new for Special Forces, which would become the RK-95TP, it was up to Seiko to design it with the uh, M90 prototype and make a semi-automatic version, the M92S. And this is kind of a... I mean, it, it is the most modern, all-new purpose-made version. For example, it has a Galil-style side-folding stock. It has modern grenade launching capability, more modern siding systems and furniture. But between 1995 and 1998, Seiko only made about 20,000 to fulfill the initial need again for special forces, more for the standing army, not for the conscripts. And then in 1999-2000, they dismantled the RK production line. So while Seiko still makes guns today, they do not make military AK-type rifles. And the last thing to really talk about, the mags. Carl uh, Clark asks about mags. This is the green mag. This is often considered a prototype, although it seems like they've made thousands of these. These were designed in the late 80s, early 90s to try to get away from the steel mag. Interestingly, they have this lanyard loop on the front molded in. They are metal reinforced at the top and the feed lips. And they would try these out and then they would refine them slightly and make them in black. And these would become the standard mags for the RK95 and of course would also fit the older RK62. Uh, sorry, I don't have any of the black ones. They're relatively uncommon in America. But years ago, Numeric had these green ones for little of nothing in brand new condition. So it seems like the ones from Finland just made it to Numeric and there you have it. So that's kind of the deal with the metal versus green polymer and black polymer. And an interesting kind of factoid, it's this mag, well, really the black version of this mag, that Arsenal in Bulgaria used as its jumping off point prototype when doing its famous Circle 10 waffle mags. So, in a way, this mag lives on today in a very good, very nicely regarded Bulgarian mag. Again, this doesn't have the full metal reinforcements running all the way up and down, just in the back lug and such, but it was a step in the right direction, and these are some of the earliest military polymer mags for NAK. So with Valmet out of the game, the last of the semi-autos were delivered over here in 1988, give or take. And of course, we're still at distributors and stores. But then in 1989, just to make doubly sure no more would come in, even with the company out of business, the Valmet was banned by name during the import ban issued by the Bush White House. And while the Seiko M92 has not been banned, none were imported because of the 1994 assault weapons ban, and by the time it sunset in 2004, Seiko was no longer making guns, and even if they did, it would have to get around the general restrictions of the 89 ban and become as a pistol, but that's not going to happen because they're not making anymore. And that's kind of where we're at with Valmets. 
And the M62, the RK62 is still standard issue in Finland today. And the ones in the fleet are being slowly upgraded to the RK62M, which is pretty cool. I mean, if it if it's not broke, don't fix it, I suppose. They also purchased, after the fall of communism, several hundred thousand Chinese and East German AKM types. Well, type 60, excuse me, type 56 and AKM. And just stuck them in reserve along with the RK-6276s. Again, in case Russia ever gets uppity. I think they learned their lesson after fighting Russia in 1917, 1918, and in 1940, or really 39 through 44, if you want to be honest. But luckily, Russia and Finland have kept their warfare to words over the years. Vamets were always expensive, which aside from the caliber, limited their appeal here, but they were also always well guarded, or excuse me, well regarded, and many have considered them some of the finest made Kalashnikovs in the world. I think, in a way, yes. Um, very durable receiver, very good quality barrel. In terms of fit and finish from a military standpoint, they're definitely the highest. Now, in terms of like fit and finish on a commercial level, there are prettier guns, because they, 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 they had a basic phosphate finish. And again, some of the furniture is interesting. I think it's cool as hell, but I can definitely understand why this furniture might look a little bizarre to people. And again, for some reason, the polymer, or the Bakelite, whatever they were using in the 70s, cracks. I don't care how well you keep it, it just seems over time, changing temperatures, pressures, whatever... It will crack. There's just really no if about it. And finally, that's that's another problem these days. Valmet spare parts are very difficult to find. Yes, they use in the X39 AK mags, but if you have a 223 or a 308, the mags are expensive and difficult to find. And while some AK internals might work, others may not, and the furniture, yeah, the original stock was just kind of welded onto the back, later as they would progress the design they would start holding it on at the roll pin, kind of Galil style, I meaning you could actually replace the stock without re-welding, and again this pistol grip, it's actually a tubular piece of steel that goes up into the receiver and even has the trigger guard riveted to it. So if you break a pistol grip, replacing it is not that simple. The only part that you can easily take off is the handguard, really. Even the muzzle device, it's not necessarily screwed on, it's actually pinned on. So you're not going to just pull one off with your hand, you need a little bit of gunsmithing. Well, again, I'm sorry I don't have anything earth-shattering or new. I wish I had any new Valmats to show you, Clark, but as you might understand, they're just too expensive to have a full collection. And one time I think I had as many as six, but all but two got sold off when we wanted to buy a house six years ago. And then of those two, about a year after we bought the house, we were still not struggling, but you know how it is. And so I needed to sell one, one more. But the good news is, I kept my favorite here, and I kept the one that I really started off wanting. As a kid, I always thought this was the cool, so definitely no real regrets. If money was no object, sure, I'd have all of them, but if I could only have one, this is it, because this is a semi-automatic version with very few changes from the RK-62. And uh, again, sorry, I don't have import numbers. I mean, you're right, as you say in your comment, you had Inner Arms, you had Odin, and you had Valmet Incorporated USA as importers. And I believe you also had uh, Stoger. I know there were four. I believe Stoger was the fourth one. But uh, beyond that, I'm sorry, I don't have numbers or anything. But it, it would not be big. I believe I've seen something like seven to 10,000 total as an estimate. But again... There's no way to verify that that I'm aware of. But I hope this was worth your 
five dollars and again I do apologize for the wait it wasn't because we were ignoring you we just wanted to give you the best video we could and we were hoping to get range time but yeah the whole COVID thing kinda caught everyone flat-footed so with that I'll let you go for now if you could like share and subscribe and if you'd like to help support us please check out the link to our patreon page this is Misha and Jana both will catch you very soon next time.